Amen. How many are grateful just for the good music that we had this morning? Amen. Amen. How many is grateful? I know we may not have every amenity that some of the other churches have, but I'd still put our singing group and our worship team up, up against any other uh, because they don't just sing. Can I just say this this morning and brag on them? And it's not because my wife's up there, but it's because I truly believe our, our music team does not sing with talent. They don't sing with, with this just special gifting. They sing with the anointing. Hello, somebody. They, they don't just sing with this arrogant attitude. They just come humbly. And they, I, if you ask any of them, they'd say, I don't know why I'm up there. I can't sing, but they can. Uh, and, and they sing with an anointing. They sing with a special gifting from God, and they give it back to him. Aren't you grateful for people like that? that I, I'm just grateful for them. Uh, I'm excited to be back in the pulpit. Um, I'm hoping I remember how to preach. Um, it's been a month, so we're going to put it to the test. Um, but uh, how many enjoyed revival in September? How many enjoyed it? It was good. Um, I know one person told me we really enjoyed them, but we'd rather hear you. And uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know about that because I kind of feel like the minor league uh, following a bunch of major league hitters. Um, but uh, you know, we're, we're just going to see today because I am not them. And uh, let's, let's just hope I don't preach one of their sermons by accident. Um, but we're going to talk about something very important today. And I think Brother David's already put my title up there. And um, I'm going to try something different today. I'm going to try some teaching preaching. So if you see this little, if I can get this stupid little thing out of my pocket, there we go. Uh, we're going to try, I'm going to try some slow down teaching preaching. We'll see how well that works. Um, but today we're going to talk about something that we're all very familiar with this time of year. And we're going to talk about, I am no longer a slave to fear. Look at somebody close to you and say, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Come on, say it like you mean it. I'm no longer a slave to fear. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and you can look at the picture and probably tell where I'm going with this. And I'm going to unpack some things about fear and the, and the current, current place that we are at as people and as the church. Um, I love the weather that we're having. I love this time of year. I love fall. And I, I could almost run outside in, in just, you know, a T-shirt and, you know, and underwear because it's, you know, it feels so good outside. I know you don't want that image, but I'm just being honest. Um, Taylor gets mad because I sleep with the window cracked open. It just feels good. It's God's natural air conditioning. Don't cost me a dime. Hallelujah. So, but this time of year, while I like the weather and I like all the things that it leads up to, we are in the most heightened spiritual darkness that we are ever in throughout the remainder of the year. The month of October is one of those months where spiritual warfare is at an all-time high. If you look and see what's going on in other religions and in other situations, you will see that there is an increased awareness and an increased activity of spiritual darkness. Throughout the month of October, the Church of Satan is fasting. They're fasting because their, uh, their holidays are coming up and they're sacrificing animals and they're doing all of their rituals. Uh, Wicca, with the witches, are, they're active, they're getting involved, they're fasting, they're doing different things. Um, everywhere you look, whether it be Walmart, whether it be on TV, uh, there's all this spiritual darkness, these monsters and demons and things of that nature that people are pushing as we prepare for Halloween. Uh, we went to a place yesterday and my brother's girlfriend, we were at this place and it was kind of like a zoo and they had all these little animatronic things and every time you would walk past them, they would say something like, I'm going to you know, steal your soul, I'm going to do all this kind of stuff. And she said, I hate Halloween. I said, me too. Because it's just, there's an increased awareness of spiritual darkness and the sad part about it is there are people who are spiritually unaware and they're buying into this stuff not realizing that they're inviting spirits on their lives into their homes and then they wonder why they struggle. They watch horror movies and they wonder why they're terrified of everybody they walk past. Well when every movie you watch is about somebody brutally murdering somebody else I'd be pretty scared too. Or when every movie you watch is about some spook around the corner about to jump out and, you know, tear your head off. Yeah, I'd be pretty frightened to live in my own house, too. Where there's all this spiritual darkness going on, and it's causing a heightened awareness of fear. Now, 
We are no strangers to fear because even though October is known as the month of fear, our whole society is ingrained with fear tactics. If you watch the news for a matter of five minutes, you'll get afraid pretty quick. Because they're telling you something else has happened. The liberals and the Democrats and the liberals and the Republicans are at each other again. And we may face hyperinflation. We may not have any bread on the shelves come Monday. You see on the news where, where, where the meteorologists saying there's a category four hurricane. We don't know which way it's going to go. It's going to decimate and probably kill hundreds of thousands of people. Well, you get on there and there's been a shooting where five people were killed by somebody that just felt like killing folks. And every time you turn on the TV, there's something to be afraid about. And there's no wonder why we live in a constant state of worry, panic, and fear. Because we're surrounded by it. We are no strangers to fear. So many people, especially since COVID, are living bound by fear. They're living bound by anxiety, bound by depression, bound by spiritual darkness. Because everywhere they look, Sister Anita, there's something to be afraid of. And there's even people sitting in this room today that you may not necessarily be afraid of some of the other things that are on the news, but there's things in your life that cause you great trepidation. The enemy's been speaking into your life. There are certain things you're worried about, certain things you're praying about, and whether you show it or not, you are living in a prison of fear and living in a prison of worry and anxiety, not knowing what's going to happen next, constantly looking over your shoulder because you feel like everything's going to fall apart at the seams at any given notice. There are people in this room who are being entrapped by the spirit of fear. But I've come by today to let you know that fear can talk to you, but fear is not the victor. I've come by to let you know that while he may be speaking lies to you, you have the power in and of yourself as a son or daughter of God to rebuke that spirit of fear because greater is he who is in me than he who is in this world and we are not slaves to fear because fear has already been conquered Amen. we're no longer slaves to fear see I hope that today I can sort of help unpack some things to you about fear because one thing you need to understand whether I get this point in or not I'm going to just say this and move on you don't have to conquer fear fear has already been conquered fear has already been defeated Fear's already been put under the blood of Jesus and you don't have to live in fear anymore. No matter how strong, no matter how, no matter how gripping fear may be on your life, you have the power to walk out of your prison of fear today. And I hope to do that and I'm going to use a very familiar story, one that you've all heard in some shape or form and that's the story of David and Goliath. Now I told you I'm going to walk through this so we're not going to read all this scripture at one time because there's a lot of scripture to cover and I've got about a three hour message to preach in about 30 minutes. Who thinks I can do it? As, as your fate so be it unto you. <laughs> 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to look at verse 1. It said, Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They, they encamped between Soko and Azekah and in Ethes Domin. Now, how many of you, when you read stories like this, would probably read right over that? Be honest. Be honest. You can't pronounce it. You don't know where it is and you don't know why it's important. But in this story, everything that the Holy Spirit put in Scripture is important because not only does it have a physical application, but it has a spiritual application. How many agree? How many know that's true? So the writer of 1 Samuel tells us that the Philistines have come up against the children of Israel. Now, one, there's several things we know about the Philistines when you read Scripture. We know that they are mighty warriors because the Bible tells us that they were skilled in the art of iron and they were the ones that would create iron uh, tools and iron, uh, um, iron weapons and stuff and that they had a monopoly on iron works. They had a monopoly on these sort of uh, weapons and things of that nature. Uh, they, they were a repetitive enemy of the people of Israel. From the time that Israel came up to the Promised Land 
all the way up into the New Testament, you will constantly see the Philistines coming up against the children of Israel. All the way, always trying to defeat them, always seeking to destroy them because the Philistines saw Israel as their continual enemy and they felt that they needed to be destroyed. So was the way with our enemy, the devil. The, Jesus said that Satan comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what fear wants to do in your life. It wants to steal, kill, and destroy whatever it can take hold of in your life. So the Philistines have come up against the people of Israel. Now the word Philistine has several different meanings. It means nomadic or rolling. But one thing it necessarily means in the Hebrew, it means to flee swiftly. The Philistines were people who did not stay in one spot very long. Sounds like some pastors I know. Anyway, let's move. I, I shouldn't have said that. Jesus, forgive me. That was the flesh. Y'all forgive me for that. Anyway, they couldn't stay in one place very long. They were the kind of people that performed a hit and run sort of, uh, war, sort of war tactic. But the word Philistine that I found interesting that it, can ask, that it can actually mean is because they were people who fled swiftly and they never could stay in a place very long, the name Philistine means instability. So we see that the enemy of instability has come, up the, has come up to fight against the people of Israel. So here we see what the first thing fear wants to do is bring instability in your life. The first purpose and the first tactic of fear is to bring instability in your faith, instability in your mind, instability in your emotions, instability in whatever area of your life it can grasp hold of because fear knows if it can make you unstable, then therefore you cannot receive what you have asked because what did James say? When he asked, let him ask in faith, unwavering for he who wavers is like a wave tossed to and fro by the sea and do not let that man think he will receive what he has asked for. Fear wants to bring instability in your life because it knows if you will struggle between God's truth and its lie, then you won't receive what you're asking for. Am I making sense this morning? <clears throat> the Philistines, the enemy of instability has shown up to fight against God's people. And they came to a very unique place. It says they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. Now, can any of you Bible scholars in here tell me what Judah means? Lion. Lion? Okay, I'm looking for another one. What did you say, Aunt Brenda? Praise. praise. The name Judah means praise. So you've got the enemy of instability coming to the land which belongs to praise. Can I tell you, if there's one thing fear, that if it wish it could take from you, it would be your praise. If there's one place that fear definitely wants to hold you captive, it is in your praise. Fear wants to make you in stay unstable in your praise because it knows if it can keep you from praising, it can keep you from being empowered. Fear knows if it can take your praise, then it can keep you from getting strengthened by God to overcome the battle that you're facing. But I'm here to tell you, don't you let fear steal your praise. Don't you let fear take your praise from God because if you let it steal your praise then you're already defeated before you ever got started. But if you, you can be like Judah, if you can be like the people of Israel in First Chronicles where it said they sent the praisers up before them and God fought their battle on their behalf. Don't you let fear steal your praise because if you let it take your praise you're already defeated before you even fight. Fear wants to take your praise. You've got to learn to praise even when you don't feel like it. Do you hear me? Praise isn't about how you feel, it's about what you know. Oh, I'm, I'm going to plow right there for a minute. Praise is not about what you feel, it's about what you know. It's not about this morning I woke up with a headache and I don't feel my ghost, my ghost bumps all over my body and feel like I want to praise. It's not about I woke up this morning with my feet hurting and my knees sore. It's not about the fact I woke up wanting to come to church this morning. It's about the fact I woke up and I know my God is faithful no matter what I'm facing. My praise is not about how I feel. It's about what I know. 
Don't you let fear steal your praise. Because if it can steal your praise, it'll change your faith. I'm taking up a good point in my sermon later on, but don't you let fear steal your praise. And don't you dare judge how somebody else praises because you don't know what kind of strength they had to muster up to get that praise out. I don't know if I'm mad or anointed right now, but either way, it makes a good point. Don't you let fear steal your praise. But the enemy of instability has come to the land of praise. Not only, but it's come to a very unique place. It gives us three names here. Soko, Azika, and Ephes Damon. Each of these places were places that Israel had named because of certain situations that had happened there. Soko means to fence in. Azika means to hedge in or to entrap or to build a wall. Ephes Damon means the valley of blood. It was a place where many battles had happened. But these names weren't named this because they were having to face their current enemy. These names came from previous battles that they had already won. In Soko, it means we were hedged in, but God saw and he delivered. Azekah means we were walled in, we were entrapped, and we saw no hope. But God in his grace and in his mercy intervened and delivered us when we didn't think deliverance was possible. Ephes Diamond means we were bloody, we were bruised, we thought we were defeated. But Jehovah Jireh, our provider, swooped in at the last moment and delivered his people And so here we have three different names of places that Israel has already battled their enemies and won. Isn't it interesting that the enemy shows up in a valley where where Israel has already conquered? What does that mean, Brother Drake? The enemy always fights in familiar territory. Grasp hold of that. The enemy always fights in familiar territory. He will always come at you with the same temptation, the same area you've always struggled with, the same thoughts, the same situations, the same weaknesses. Satan has no original plan. Why do you think Paul said we are not ignorant of his devices? Are are y'all with me this morning? Satan, the enemy, fights in familiar territory. The enemy always shows up, Amber, in places where you've already conquered because he knows if he can show up and put fear in your life, he can make you second guess, Missy, your original victory. And then you start wondering, did I really get delivered from that? Did I really get saved from that? Did I really come out of that? Did God really answer my prayer? Hello? Fear always comes in familiar territory to make you second guess your original victory. So here we have the enemy of instability coming and trying to intimidate the people of Israel and trying to force them into defeat. And they do so by using a champion named Goliath. Verse, let's see if I put it up here. Verse 2 through 3 And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered. We read that. The Philistines stood on a mountain, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion, say champion, Champion. went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, or 15 pounds, and a shield bearer went before him. Now here's what we know about Goliath. According to the measurements, when you take them all out, he's 9.5 feet tall. That's a big man. I'm roughly 5'11", so that's, well, that's a good many more than me. But nine and a half feet tall, that's a pretty big man. His armor of all of the bronze weighs roughly 175 pounds. This was just a little interesting thing. When you look at the history of Goliath, you'll find out he was of the descendants of Og. And if you do your Hebrew research, you will find that his mother was Orpah. I'll preach that one day, but you remember the Ruth and Orpah story where it said Orpah, Orpah kissed and ran, but Ruth clave. Orpah was his mother. Okay, do your research, you'll find that to be true. 
And it says that he was a fierce warrior. Now, one interesting thing that I found about this is not his height, not just what he's dressed in, but the fact that the scripture in verse 4 calls him a champion. Now, when you do some research on the word champion, you will find that, according to the dictionary, a champion is one who has defeated or surpassed all of his rivals. In a, in a sense of the word, a champion is somebody who has a history. Are you following me? A champion is somebody who has a history, and not just a history, but a history of being undefeated in battle. So... The Philistines were very strategic in how they used Goliath and Miss Hazel. They wanted to make sure that the people of Israel knew he was a champion because if they could make sure they knew that, it would intimidate them and make them believe that the army was undefeatable. Are you catching what I'm saying? It wasn't that the Philistines were undefeatable themselves because they had been defeated in previous battles. But Goliath himself was undefeatable. And so they used him as a tactic of war to intimidate the Israeli army into believing that they could not conquer the army. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The spirit of fear is nothing but an intimidation tactic of the enemy. Do you hear me? The spirit of fear is nothing but an intimidation tactic of the enemy to try and make you believe that whatever you're facing is unconquerable. The spirit of fear is nothing but an intimidation tactic to make you believe that what you're facing is bigger than God, is bigger than your strength, is bigger than what your faith says, and so therefore you'll be intimidated and will not face it head on. Am I helping anybody this morning? If I am, give me at least a hand or something. Thank you, thank you. I gotta stay, I gotta stay to this, I'll get, I'll get sidetracked. Fear is a ploy of the enemy to make you freeze and to make you shut down. The enemy knows if he can instill fear about whatever you're facing and make it appear bigger than what it really is, You'll give up, you'll stop praying, you'll stop believing, you'll, start do, you'll stop doing all the things which we know to do according to faith, and he wins. See, the enemy don't win unless you quit. Hello, somebody. The enemy cannot win over you unless you give up. That's all Goliath was. He was a pawn in the plan of the Philistines to make them appear more menacing and more intimidating than what they really were. And it says in verse 8 through 10 that when Goliath came to intimidate the people of Israel, that he stood there and he cried out and said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Do you, did you notice how many times Goliath said, give me a man? Did you notice that? You notice how, 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 how specific he was about how he wanted a one-on-one -on -one battle? Now explain to me why a man who's 9.5 feet tall wearing almost 200 pounds of armor who's apparently this big bulking giant who can, who can take on anybody, why is he calling for one person? If he's as big and bad as what they made him out to be, why hadn't he gone over to the other side and tore every one of them limb from limb? Because Goliath's a coward. Do you hear me? Come on, somebody. I'm trying to help you this morning. Goliath called out for one man because he knew that, they, that the Philistines had been defeated by the army of Israel time and time again. He knew he could not take on the army. Therefore, he chose to isolate one man. Can I tell you that one of the greatest tactics of the enemy is the tactic of isolation? 
One of the greatest attacks he has against God's people is to isolate you and get you in loneliness. Make you feel like nobody sees what you're going through. Make you feel like nobody else would understand what you're facing. Make you suffer in silence. Because he knows if he can get you to suffer in silence, if he can get you to suffer and not tell anybody about it, if he can get you to suffer and not ask for the prayer request, if he can get you to suffer and not come up to the prayer line, if he can get you to suffer and just stay to yourself and even stay away from church, then he knows he can get you. Because the only way he can defeat you is one-on-one. -on -one. Goliath is a coward. He knows he can't take the whole army. He knows he can only win if he's got a one-on-one -on -one battle. So I'm here to tell you, if you're facing something, you better not stay out of this building. If you're facing something, you better not go and seclude yourself behind your bedroom door. Because what you don't know is Satan wants to get you by yourself. He wants to make you feel like you're an island. He wants to make you feel like you're in a cave and nobody can reach you. But when you come into the house of God and you get together with the brothers and the sisters and you tell them guess what I'm going through then the army comes together and it sends the enemy running fear cannot face the army Fear can only take us on one to one. But when you get out of your own head and you start speaking and saying, guess what, Brother Eddie? I'm going through this. I need you to pray. And the men of the church gather around and anoint you with oil. It sends the devil running and he has no ground to stand on. When you come on Monday nights to Freedom Group and you say, I'm struggling with this. I need y'all to help me pray. And the sisters of God gather around the one struggling woman and say we're going to hold your hands up through this battle then fear has nowhere to stay because fear cannot take the army don't you dare let the enemy keep you out of the house of God and getting strengthened from your brothers and sisters. The Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. Not one person. It's his people. If you need deliverance, you need salvation, you need God to show up, this is the place for you to be because this is where he shows up. Give him praise this morning. Good God. Well, Brother Drake, you just want more attendance. That's bull. I don't care nothing about attendance. I'm just tired of people feeling like they have no hope. The hope of the world is found in Jesus, and Jesus is found in the house of God. If you want hope, this is the place to come and find it. Help me, Lord. One of the key tactics of the enemy is isolation because he knows he can't take on the army. He knows he can't take on more than one. That's why Goliath said, send me a man. Goliath was a bully. That's all Satan and fear are. They're limp-wristed bullies who try to intimidate you and believe that you can't overcome what you're facing. But the Word says we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus and we have been given the victory through the blood of the Lamb. Yes, 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 yes. We are no longer slaves to fear. Goliath defied the armies of Israel calling for one man to fight him. And in that day, it was a coward thing to back down from a challenge. Goliath knew what he was doing because if nobody came out and faced him, that was an automatic surrender on Israel's part and the Philistines would win without a battle ever taking place. The enemy wants to intimidate you with fear to believe that you can't take what he's bringing against you.
But my word, this book says, God will not allow me to suffer beyond what I am able to bear. But in every temptation will make a way of escape so that I can bear it. His word told me through Paul that my grace is sufficient. My power is perfected in weakness. It doesn't matter how big the giant is. My God is much bigger. But Satan wants to isolate you and make you fear. That was the plan of the Philistines and the plan of Goliath, and it worked. Because it says, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. How crazy is it that the army, who was more powerful, who had a better record than the other ones, who had defeated the Philistines so many times, they're the ones hiding out in their tents, shaking in their boots, wondering, what are we going to do? The voice of the enemy had shut them down. Shut them down, and here's what it had done. The voice of fear had shut them down and made them forget who they served. The people of Israel had a long track record with God. Several hundred years before, you know the story of the Exodus. They had been in bondage for almost 430 years. And here shows up Moses and he comes to Pharaoh, let my people go. And you know the story of all the plagues. If you ain't seen it, go watch Charlton Heston's The Ten Commandments. It's a great movie. But you see the, you see the deliverance of the people of Israel. And they, give, they come out of Egyptian bondage. Then they're standing at the banks of the Red Sea. And here comes the, the Egyptians come to take them out again. And God tells Moses to lift up his rod and the Red Sea parts. And six million people cross on dry ground. And then God folds the waters back over the enemy and drowns them out. Then they're in the wilderness complaining that they have nothing to drink. And God brings water from a rock. Then they're complaining that they have nothing to eat. And God rains down manna from heaven that they didn't didn't have to work for or sweat for. All they had to do was go out and pick it up every morning and eat it. Then you see them when they come into the land of Israel how they face walled cities on the land of Canaan and they face Jericho and all these other walled cities and how God brought the cities down when all it was was obedience and praise. All these things that God had done for them yet all it took was one voice of intimidation one voice and one lie. Yes. One lie yes. that shut them down and made them think that giant's bigger than our God who's delivered us time and time again. Yes. That's the, that is the ploy of fear. To intimidate you and make you switch fates. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I might as well just preach it like I want to. Come on. The purpose of fear is to get you to switch fates. Some people say faith is not fear. Oh, yes, it is. It's just fear in the wrong thing. Fear is faith in what the enemy says is true. Fear is faith that what Satan says is going to come to pass. You actually believe it will. Fear, the fear is actually faith that the enemy's lies is more true than God's promises. Oh, that's a hard word, isn't it? But how many times, Misty, have we bought into that? Yeah. How many times have we believed those lies, like you talked about this morning, that you're going to need that money, so you better not give it. You're going to be without if you give it this morning. How many times, Sister Teresa, have we heard those things of the enemy telling us? And I'm going to go ahead to my next point. It said that morning and evening, he intimidated 40 times, 40 days, two times a day. That's 80 times, 80 times. Constantly bombarding, bombarding, bombarding with the lies. The enemy never tells you something once. You know that the term devil is not a name, it's a title. It's a job description. It's a Greek word diablos and it means to hurl. It speaks of somebody constantly throwing a ball against the wall until the ball finally goes through the wall. What the enemy and what fear does is constantly throws lies in your mind so that eventually it'll get into your head and you'll start to believe it. Am I making sense this morning? But how many times have we bought into the lies? 
you'll never be healed. That child you've prayed for will never get saved. That job you've been believing for, it's not going to happen. Or how about one from my own life? That baby you think's coming, ain't going to happen. And then when it happens, I'm going to take her. I'm going to kill her. How many times have we been paralyzed in fear because we believed a lie? I'll tell you a story, and I don't, this has got to come off. It's getting hot. I hope I can take it off. Help me, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. About three weeks, well, maybe a month ago, I was standing in my kitchen praying. And for those of you that may not know, we've prayed for three years for a baby. Taylor's pregnant. She's 21 weeks tomorrow. And we knew, yes, praise God for that. We knew we had ultrasounds coming up. Now, if you've never been through miscarriage, God bless you. Thank God for it. We've been through two. One molar pregnancy. Three times we've had to go have ultrasounds. And to be honest with you, every time I hear the word ultrasound, even now, there's a pit in my stomach. Because every time I've gone to an ultrasound, it's always been, Mr. and Miss Dorset, we're sorry. But there's no viability. There's no, there's no baby. There's no this. So ultrasound is a, is, a, is, a, is a nasty word to me. And so, Rodney, I'm standing in my kitchen knowing that in a week, uh, in, in, in two weeks, I've got to go for, we've got to go for an anatomy scan where they look at if, if, if our baby's fingers and toes and everything's growing right and just to make sure. And Sister Daisy, there's not been any signs of problems. Nothing, thank God. But then the enemy whispered to me and he said, you're going to go and she's going to be dead. Fear started gripping me. And fear kept saying, I don't know why you're looking forward to this. There's not going to be anything there. That doctor's going to tell you to have an abortion because that, there's no viability of life. Nothing has pointed towards that, but that, mind, that thought immediately. The enemy started planting it. And I started getting terrified, Maddie, and thinking, God, get me out of this. God, you've got to do something. I don't know what to do, Lord. I'm terrified. And Sister Teresa, as God is my witness. I never heard the voice of God more clear than I did that day. He said, the enemy doesn't know the future. Amen. Yes, amen. He said, he may know what's going on in the present, but he don't know the future. He can't predict what will happen tomorrow. And immediately, Susan, a calm came over me. And immediately I heard the words, I am not afraid. And the, the Lord sent me to 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, Miss Hazel, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And every day leading up to that anatomy scan last Friday, I would say, I am not afraid, for God has not given me a spirit of fear. And can I tell you as a testimony of God that Friday when we left, they said, Mr. and Miss Dorset, your baby looks perfect. There's nothing wrong with her. She's developing. Yes, Hallelujah. I want you to hear me this morning. Fear is a liar. Come on, give him some praise this morning. Hallelujah. Come on, give him some real praise this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo. Don't you dare let the enemy steal your healing by putting you in fear. Don't you dare let the enemy steal your prayer by living in fear. Don't you dare listen to the lies of the enemy. Satan is a liar and the father of all lies. He does not know the future. Amen. Praise God. Yes. Woo! Come on, lift your hands right now and just, oh, praise you, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. But the way the enemy works is to continuously throw lies into your mind 
So eventually you'll believe what he says. And you'll start thinking that what he says is truth over God's word. Every day, night and day, night and day. Some of you hear the crazy tapes going on in your mind every morning and every night. It's never going to happen. It's not going to occur. God's not going to come through. You're going to fail. You're worthless. Nobody loves you. The voice of fear hitting you every morning, every night. And it makes you paralyzed with fear. And here we have the people of Israel paralyzed with fear. And every day they're hearing these accusations thinking there's no hope. But then a little boy from Bethlehem shows up. Oh, I'm going somewhere and y'all just, I wish y'all knew where I was going. Whew. A little boy from Bethlehem shows up. And he starts hearing all this mess going on and he wonders, what, in the, what on earth is going on? He hears this Philistine mouthing and he said, what is this joker? This is Drake's unauthorized translation. What, who does this joker think he is? Does he know who he's talking about? Yes. Are y'all all too, too yellow to take him on? I'll take him. And his brothers said, you're crazy. Hmm. They said, you're being a narcissist. You're just trying to make yourself into something that you're not. And David said, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Can I tell you this morning there is a cause? Oh, that's the Holy Ghost. He just told me that. There is a cause this morning. It may look big and it may look bad, but it can't defeat you. It may look big and it may look bad, but for the sake of your children, for the sake of your family, you better fight and you better fight hard because Satan's not going to give up. And if you do, he wins. But if you keep fighting, he can't gain ground. There is a cause. David said, is there not a cause? Is there not a reason to go to battle? And they brought him before Saul. And Saul said, boy, you can't do this. There's no way. You're just a young boy. And he's, a, he's, been, a, he's been in war since he was five. And then David answered him and he said, your servant used to keep his sheep. Oh, I like this. And when a bear, a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose up against me, I caught it by the beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the army armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me. Say, he's delivered me. The Lord who delivered me from the mouth, the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear. He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. I'm here to tell you the same God who delivered you from hell can deliver you from fear. The same God who delivered you out of the grip of the enemy can release you out of the grip of whatever you're facing this morning. The same God who brought you in to the family of God will be the same God who will keep you and see you through whatever battle you are facing. Do you hear me this morning? Hallelujah. David wasn't in fear like the rest of them because he saw Brother Eddie, he saw Goliath for what he was. He was a loud mouth bully who was too afraid to take on the armies. And David said, moreover, he's defied the living God and any enemy of God is already defeated. I'm not worried how big he looks. He's coming down because he's defied the Lord. And he kept going. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. He said, that same Philistine, this, the same enemy that you're facing today, God will deliver him into my hands because God's delivered me time and time again. You know what? One thing you need to learn to do when fear starts speaking to you, remind yourself of all the other times God has showed up. Amen. 
Remind yourself of those times, Sister Brenda, where you felt the, the, just the darkness of loneliness and fear and depression just seeping in on you. But God shed his light on your life and you were instantly filled with peace that surpassed all understanding. Remind yourselves, Misty, of those times where, yeah, we lost a car, but we didn't lose two children. Remind yourself of those times, Susan, where you were praying for God to deliver certain things into your hands for your boys' school and God sent it your way without you even ever expecting it. Remind yourself of all the times God has been faithful and let fear know you will not convince me otherwise because if he's been faithful then, he'll be faithful now. If he's done it once, he'll do it again. Look at somebody and tell them if he's done it once, he'll do it again. Come on, tell them. If he's done it once, he'll do it again. I'm almost finished. Give me 10 more minutes. David had not forgotten the faithfulness of his God. So he took out and he went up against this Philistine. It said they tried to put the armor of Saul on him, but it was too big. This ain't in my sermon, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you, you cannot fight your demons with somebody else's armor. Come on. You can't fight your own demons with somebody else's faith. You've got to have your own. It don't matter if grandmama spoke in tongues and prayed till she fell out on the floor and was in the spirit for 40 minutes. You've got to have your own strength in you. You can't fight and live out the grandmama's faith. You've got to have your own. But it says in verse 40 that he took his staff in his hand and he chose for him five smooth stones, say five, five, from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag and a pouch which he had and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. Why five stones? Five is the number of grace. I already told you, grace is getting what we don't deserve. But grace is also specially endowed favor from God. When you have the grace of God on your life, things happen in your life that shouldn't happen. Hello. When you have the favor of God on your life, you get the promotion that somebody else was deserving of and that you weren't even qualified for. When you have the grace of God on your life, then God starts moving things in your life in a way that shouldn't be moving. But because you belong to him, you have his specially endowed favor on your life. For David, this specially endowed favor was a strength to fight a giant that everybody else was too scared of. God had given David grace to fight an enemy that everybody else thought was undefeatable. That's how come he could go to battle just with five smooth stones because he knew and he even said, you come to me. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm going to go ahead. He said, he said, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Can I tell you, every battle you fight in his name is a battle that's already won. A battle that you fight in the name of Jesus Christ has already been won in the Spirit. He said, I come to you in the name. Quit trying to fight your battles in your own strength and start fighting in his name. The Bible says that when, when, when Michael and Satan were wrestling over the body of Moses, that Michael didn't say, I rebuke you. He said, the Lord rebuke you. When the devil starts coming to your doorstep, knocking on your front door, saying, hey, I'm here again. I've come to bring fear. I've come to bring anxiety. I've come to bring depression. You say, I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Satan has to flee because he cannot stand in the presence of the holy God. Amen. Praise God for his name. I come to you in the name. Then he said, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you and I will give your carcass of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air. And the wild beasts of the field that all earth may know there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and 
fear for the battle is the Lord's. I've said it time and time again but hear me one more time. This battle is not yours. This battle is the Lord's. This battle is not in your hand. This battle is in his hand. Quit trying to fight it in your own strength. That's why you're worn out. That's why you're worn down. That's why you feel defeated because it's not by might, not by power but by his spirit that we overcome every every tactic and every while of the enemy. The battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. And I'll tell you who's a champion. Jesus Christ has never lost a battle. He has never lost. He's always been victorious and we can rest assured our battle is won when we give it to him. Hello. I'm getting there. Y'all bear with me. I got a few more points and we'll go home. It says that David drew near and ran towards him, and you know the story. He slung the rock, and it knocked Goliath down. Interesting thing here. It wasn't the rock that killed Goliath. We taught it all wrong in Sunday school. The stone didn't kill him. The stone just knocked him unconscious. Now I did a little, this is just a side thing just for your interest. Some people have done studies that the way that David probably threw the rock, it was probably going at a rate of about 20 miles per hour. So imagine a rock hitting you in the head at about 20 miles per hour. That's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. But it knocked Goliath unconscious. And it said that David ran in verse 51 and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it, took Goliath's sword and killed him and cut off his head with it. One of our problems is we think we can defeat the devil by shouting at him. Hello. We think we can defeat him just by praying about it. When in reality, what we need to have is a sword. Come on. The only way you can defeat the enemy effectively is with a sword. No, not, not, our, our weapons are not carnal. They're not carnal. It's not, it's not a physical sword. It's a spiritual sword. And what's the spiritual sword? Paul told us in Ephesians chapter 6, in taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, if you want to cut the head off of fear, if you want to cut the head off of the enemy, then you've got to have some Word in you. What did Jesus do when Satan tempted him in the wilderness? Every time he tempted, it, tempted him, Jesus said, It is written three times it is written and every time he said it is written it was a blow to the side of the enemy with the sword of the spirit you hear me this morning you want to overcome fear you want to overcome the enemy you want to overcome your battle you better get a sword in your mouth and you better know your scripture because if you don't have any scripture in you then he'll take you down I told you earlier, I quoted every day, God has not given me the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. 365 times in the Bible, it says, be courageous and be not afraid. That's a promise for every day of the year. Problem is, we don't know enough of the word to use it. Come on. Be easy on us, Brother Drake. No, I'm not going to be easy on you because you can help yourself. You get in your word, God will strengthen you for your battle. Don't expect to come on Sundays and Wednesdays and fight your battles Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That's not enough training to get you through every day. You better have it in you. Because if you don't have it in you, he'll get you. David drew the sword, cut his head off. And from that moment forward, the Israel, Israelites were victorious over the Philistines. Now, I don't have this in my sermon. Come on, Misty, you can come. But I feel like it's imperative to say. This story shows us how we can face fear, intimidation, and the wiles of the enemy. But one thing you need to understand in this story, and I said it in the beginning, fear, we don't have to conquer fear. Fear has already been conquered. Because in this story, we are not David. We preach it all the time. We got to be like David, be like David. No. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Right. Not follow me as I follow David. Not me as I follow Peter. Not me as I follow Samson. No. Follow me as I follow Christ. 
The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. David is a type and shadow of Jesus. Because the Bible says in Colossians that Jesus has made a public spectacle of the principalities and spirits of this world triumphing over them. That includes not only Satan himself, but the spirit of fear. Why do you think we don't have to be afraid? Not just because of the promises of God, but because the champion, Jesus Christ, has already gone before us. And he's fought our battle. And while it looked like he lost, on the third day he raised from the grave, ascended to the right hand of the Father 50 days later, and is forever making intercession on our behalf. You are a conqueror because Jesus conquered hell, death, and the grave. You don't have to conquer fear. It's already been conquered. So quit trying to fight a battle that's already been won. Well, Brother Drake, how, why am I suffering with fear? Because you're entertaining it. Oh, that's easier said than done. No. Paul said, our weapons are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. A stronghold means a headlock. When Satan has you in a fearful mindset, he's got you in a spiritual headlock. But do you know the way that you change that spiritual headlock? You change your mind. I preached about it a month, uh, two months ago. You change your mind by replacing every lie of the enemy with the truth of God's Word. Amen. When the enemy comes at you and says, you're never going to be healed, you might as well give up and die. You quote Isaiah 53 and 5, by his stripes I am healed. When he says, your children will never be saved, they'll never be reconciled, they'll go to hell with me. You'll say, the Bible says, as for me and my household, we shall be saved. When the enemy comes at you, you remind him he's already been defeated. He's not a victor. He is the victim and you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Amen. You don't have to live in fear because Jesus has destroyed every bondage and you are no longer a slave to fear. I want you to bow your head this morning and close your eyes.